James. Uh, James, I'm on the team here uh, at St. Bartholomew's. It's good to be here this morning uh, considering this psalm. What a joy. Fantastic. But uh, the most exciting thing about me at the moment is not actually me. It's my wife who's pregnant. Get in. That's more like it. And so uh, just wondering, um, uh, I'm kind of old for a dad. I think I'm pretty old. I'm geriatric almost. Uh, and the question that I wonder uh, in this is how do you, how do you uh, raise kids to pray uh, and love uh, Jesus? Uh, how do you do that when uh, it's, it's easy on Sunday, we're at Sunday, we're having a good time, life is good. But how do we do that when things go wrong? When uh, everything goes peat tong in life, not as you expected. How do you raise kids to know and to love the Lord when things go wrong? And we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about that this morning. And hopefully, hopefully what I say uh, might be helpful uh, and might aid you uh, as you think about that uh, this morning. There we go. I've got everything sorted. Amazing. Just surviving. Great. Let's, uh, let's open a word of prayer and then we'll look at this uh, psalm. It's a bit of a down one, but hopefully uh, we'll find some joy in it. Uh, so we've uh, just read in Psalm 119. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes, your law, the things you say to me, God. And so, Father, we pray that we would look to you face to face this morning. We pray that you would work in our hearts. Please help us as we consider and what you have said to us in Psalm 86 and in these statutes uh, this morning. Uh, we know that sometimes it's hard. We know that sometimes you disagree with us. That's okay. You're in charge. But we know that you love us and that you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great. Brilliant. Do keep your Bibles open. Uh, and just um, uh, we're going to go through this passage. We're going to be absolutely brilliant. And prayer is, is a privilege of Christians, uh, but how do we pray to a good God when things go wrong? If God loves us and things go wrong, how do we pray to him that it makes life a bit easy, difficult? So let me ask you, what do you do? What's your, your go-to when things go wrong in life? What's the thing that you go to when things go wrong in life? So here we go. Things go wrong. Sad face emoji. What do you do when things go wrong? What do you do? You might, you might go to the pub, like Homer Simpson, down at Moe's, have a good time. Absolutely brilliant. All my mates are there, like Cheers. Who remembers Cheers from the 80s? Maybe you, you go to the bookies. You've got a bit of financial trouble. I know. I know a trick. My horse, one leg pony, is going to come in for certain this time. He's a winner. Maybe you've got a special place uh, that you go to. Uh, down where we are in uh, Church of the Saviour, you can go up to Fishmore Reservoir, walk around there, or up to the old Everton playing fields. Uh, you can go and chill out there. Go up to Darwin Tower, and there you feel close to God when things go wrong. Maybe maybe it's just comfort food. Net Netflix, bit of ice cream, get the cream in. Ah, binge watch seven series in a weekend. I can do that. No problem. Maybe it's simply you just go home uh, and you get a hug off mum. Uh, mums always make it better, don't they? Who's, who's a mum here? Put a hand up. I think lots of us are mums. Yeah, mums, you're absolutely brilliant. Great. But uh, what we're going to see in this uh, uh, psalm is uh, David, who's writing the psalm. Things have gone wrong. Oh, no. So look down at verse 14 uh, in our reading. Uh, the arrogant are attacking me. Oh God, a band of ruthless men seek my life. They're ruthless. They're out to get them. Maybe, maybe you felt like that at, at school. Someone's out to get you at school on the playing field there. A band of ruthless men seek my life. They've got no regard for you. What would you pray if you were David in that situation? What do you pray when things go wrong? I love Duncan's honesty this morning about the getting cut off in traffic. That's a bit of a prayer, isn't it? Ah, oh, 
God, won't you smite them down for cutting me off in traffic? Won't you yes. force them to have an accident? That's maybe the kind of thing that we might be tempted to pray. And it's a bit of a, a trick question. What would you pray? Because in this psalm, we see a model of what how we should pray uh, when things go wrong in our life. Uh, and David models that to us. So we've got four points. We're going to go through them uh, very quickly. But the, I think the strap line of the psalm is that David prays in sad times that he would trust Jesus more. God is good. God loves him. He cares for him. He prays that he would trust Jesus more. So I wonder if you if maybe your parents say something and you disagree with them totally. You're like, ah, oh, that's so unfair. But you know that they love you, that they care for you. And so you pray that you trust them. And so David prays that he would trust his heavenly father when sad times. First thing he prays there in verses three to four is that he prays that he would be joyful. The Christian life, we think it's a lot about rules and about candles and smoke and that kind of stuff. But at the heart of the Christian life is joy. Did you know that? It's being joyful in the Lord. I know Lancashire, we're quite, we're quite down. We don't like to show our emotions too much. Is that right? South Africans, we're the opposite. We're like, woohoo! Everything's amazing. Lancashire, it's quite chill. But David prays for joy. Just look at verse 3 there uh, in our psalm, Psalm 32. Have mercy, O oh Lord, for I call to you all day long. I've received mercy. Jesus has died for me. Bring joy to your servant. Don't let me forget the good news of the gospel. Jesus is good news. Woohoo! Friday life, I had the crackers out. It was my worst health and safety thing. All the kids were like, Popping them in their faces was bad. But it's joyful. You get a cracker out. It's like fireworks. Good news for Jesus. Hooray. The next thing that David prays is David prays that he would remember who God is. Just look at verses 5 to 10 there. He's reminding himself that God is good. So tough times, you think, how can God be good and this is happening to me? Ever, anyone ever thought that, yeah? Maybe, yeah? How can God be good and I get a speeding fine? That's ridiculous. How can God be good and something really, really sad happens in my life? So what does David do? Just look at verse 5. He reminds himself who God is. He has a word, for, he has a word with himself. Who's ever had a, a word with himself? So you set yourself to rights. You are forgiven. Lord, you forgive. You are good, Lord. God, you abound in love to all who call to you. You are a loving God. I know this is hard now, but you love. And then just look down. Uh, Lord, when I call to you in trouble, verse 7, you answer. I might not get the answer I want, but you do answer. You're always there. You give mercy when I need it, verse 6. Verse 8. Uh, you are God over all the heavens. You've made everything. You're in charge. You're infinitely big. You know things better than I could ever know it. No deeds can compare with yours. You've made everything, Lord. The beautiful sunrises, the beautiful sunsets. Every breath I have is a gift of yours. Then verse 9, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, God. Everyone, everywhere, will one day come and worship God. God is king over all the peoples uh, on earth. He's king over everything, even Blackburn uh, Council. He's king uh, everywhere, uh, wherever he goes. For great are your marvelous deeds. You alone are God. David reminds himself that God is good, that God is merciful, that God is loving him, even though he's going through a really, 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 really tough time. Even though arrogant people are trying to harm him and hurt him. God reminds himself that God is good, that he shouldn't grumble against God. Then next, what we see is that David prays that God would change his heart and not his situation. Verse 11, I think as this is something I need to remind myself the whole time uh, as, I, as a Christian, as I go through uh, the Christian life. So if God is good, uh, if we've got a beautiful future secured, we've got a joyful future secured, 
then tough times that we go through, heaven's coming, are not random. God is preparing us for that beautiful, awesome future that's to come. God is teaching us for our own good. So when, we, when we're teenagers, we're growing up, uh, we've got a bright future ahead of us. Something's waiting. It's going to be amazing. What are our parents doing? They're teaching us and preparing us for that glorious future that's going to come. That's absolutely amazing. We don't know what it looks like just yet. We don't know what it, what it might be, but it is amazing. But the Bible, we know that our future is in heaven. It's not down here on earth. Whatever happens down here on earth, our future, 40, 50, 30 years, 70 years down the line, is in heaven, and it's going to be there uh, forever. And so God, David, uh, prays that his heart would be changed and not his, his circumstances. So we might be tempted to pray, oh, God, change my circumstances. Take away this horrible thing that's causing pain in my life. But what am I neglecting there is the heart change that I need to go through if I ever want to get into that beautiful, glorious future. It might be easier to change our circumstances for a moment. Very easy. Ah, oh, my, my problem is gone. That's good news. I can sit back easy, relax. But my heart hasn't changed. The thing that I need to change to go and be with God forever, to love him and know him, that thing hasn't changed. And so when we go through tough times, God is changing our heart. Just look at verse 11. Just look down what David prays in verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. Teach me how I should live. I'm going to live with you in heaven forever. Teach me what you like and how I should live so I can know how to behave in your household when I get there, that I will walk in your truth. Help me to walk the way that you want me to walk. No one else is going to teach me. My friends at school aren't going to teach me. My, the newspapers aren't going to teach me. No one else in the world is going to teach me. Only the Bible, only God. And give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. May my heart be resolute and undivided. So what's the temptation when things are tough, when things go wrong? We look for a quick fix, don't we? Whatever it is, shorter money, I'll go to the bookies, they'll all sort it out. My heart is broken, I'll have a quick rebound romance, that will make me feel better. But David prays that his heart would be undivided, and that he'd look to Jesus, even in the tough times, even when things uh, go wrong. So maybe you want to get married and, and someone comes along who's totally inappropriate to marry and you think, oh, I'll just marry them. It's fine. That's the quick fix. David prays that my heart would be set on Jesus. I'm going to be with him forever. My heart better be living that way uh, as it is. And so um, the thing is, we need to keep going for God in a situation. So wives, I wonder if you've ever had this situation. Uh, you're going somewhere on a journey. What's the, uh, what's the longest route to a destination? A shortcut. Yeah. The husband's like, I know a shortcut, a quick fix that will get us there. Three hours later, we're still lost. We haven't reached our destination. True. The lads are nodding. They're like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, been there, know that. We've certainly been there, Sarah. Yeah. I always know a quick fix. Always a long route. But David, but here, yeah, if we stick with Jesus, if we do the hard yards and keeping going, if we keep our eyes on the track, don't look for the quick fix, don't look for the shortcuts. David, God will get us there. If we have a heart uh, that's undivided. So what's the, what might be the thing that might divide our hearts when we think about coming to church on Sunday? What's the thing that might stop us being resolute in following Jesus on Sunday? What's the thing that might divide our hearts when we think about a, a praying together as a church family on Saturdays? What's, what's the pressure there that's going to draw us away? What's the thing that looks more attraction, attractive? I've got a, um, uh, in Scotland, I came in Glasgow, 
one of the heroes. I, I was living in Glasgow for many years. One of the heroes in Glasgow is a guy called John Payton Patton. I never know how to say his name. Who's heard of John Patton? Maybe a couple of us. Sarah has. Yeah. He was a missionary. He went to Vanuatu, the New Hebrides in South Pacific. He had walked to church with his dad nine miles in the morning and nine miles home. Uh, and they'd talk about uh, Jesus and what they heard in the sermon there. And in 42 years, his father missed church three times. Once because he had the deadly flu, once because the snow was up to their shoulders, and once I can't remember. His heart was absolutely resolute, absolutely set on Jesus, on getting to God's kingdom and being with him uh, forever. Right, we've really, we've really massaged that in. So hopefully, hopefully that's something that will stick with us. The fourth thing that David prays is that David looks to the Bible, just look, uh, just like his mum. He looks to the Bible. So we're in verses fourteen to seventeen here, uh, and just look down at verse. You have to, be, you have to be a Bible nerd to know this. So some of you guys would have picked this up, I know. But look at verse fifteen. But you, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. What verse in the Old Testament is that? Anyone? It's okay. Exodus 34, verse 6. David knows his Bible. He goes to his Bible. He reads his Bible. He knows it off by heart. He's gone to it. He remembers it. He remembers who God is uh, from the Bible. So when things go wrong in life, it's very easy to stop reading the Bible, isn't it? It seems a bit hard. I just read these words. How's that going to fix my problem? What difference is that going to make? Things out there seem more relevant. So we put the Bible down. Maybe time pressures at work. It's hard to read our Bible uh, in our quiet times. It's hard to read the Bible in the morning or the evening, whatever. So we put the Bible down. And that's true even if we're retired, isn't it? Some of us, when we get retired, we think we'd have more time to read the Bible, but we have less. We get more busy, don't we? But David, when he's going through struggle, he keeps his eyes, he keeps his nose in the book. He reads God's word because he knows that God's words are the most important thing that he could ever have uh, in his life. Maybe some things that we read in the Bible are unpopular. So unpopular with the world out there. And they seem hard. And so we think, how can this word, written 2,000 years ago and even more, be relevant to me today? It's God's word to us. It's the thing that God wants us to know, that he has said for us. If God is infinitely big, then he can speak clearly to us even our generations. And so David, uh, in tough times, he's reading his Bible. He's keeping his nose on the book, even though things are hard, even though people are saying, ah, just do something else, and that will fix your problem. But where does get David get this conviction from? I wonder if you noticed there. Just look at verse uh, 17. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies might see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped and comforted me. Oh, wrong verse, sorry. Verse 16, here we go. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant. And here's the money line. And save the son of your maidservant. Where has David learned to trust God in hard times? Where has David learned to keep reading his Bible even though things have gone hard? Where has David learned not to have a divided heart? From his mum, his mum, from being a baby, he's learned to love the Lord Jesus. And so I, I'm a vicar, I stand up here, I do fun stuff. But the most important person in our, our child's life, when, certainly in the early years, is going to be Sarah. Sarah is going to be the one that teaches them to know and trust the Bible. Bottle in one hand, book in the other, raising them up in the Lord. Uh, in all things. The Bible's like mother's milk uh, to him. So great, brilliant. So there's David's uh, four things that he prays when things go wrong in his life. Uh, David prays 
that he would trust Jesus more and more. He prays for joy, even though times might be tough. He's got a glorious future. Heaven is coming, and it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be better than anything ever. Who has surfed here? Has anyone surfed here? John surfed, right? Billabong? Only a surfer knows the feeling. If you've never surfed, you'll never know the joys of surfing. I know, John knows, because we've surfed before. But you guys don't know, because you've never done it. Heaven is going to be amazing. We can't conceive of it yet. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. He's got a glorious future. Then rather than blaming God, he reminds God himself of who God is, that God is good, that God loves him. What's the first thing you do when things go wrong? God doesn't love me. God doesn't care. David reminds himself that God loves him. And then if God is good and if God's in charge, he prays that God would change not his circumstances, but would rather change his heart, that he would stick with Jesus, even though the temptation might not be. And then finally, David looks to God, God's word. He trusts what Jesus says, even though it's hard and unpopular, even uh, if others disagree with him. And so we, we might have uh, looked at that list and thought, well, good grief, James, that's a long way away from where I am this morning. Uh, I'm nowhere near that. This I've switched off. This clearly isn't for me. But we can be confident because this psalm, uh, David is praying the psalm, but it's really Jesus who's singing the psalm through David. Jesus is the main speaker uh, in the psalm. And things went wrong for Jesus, didn't they? Jesus, maybe Jesus was born, he was very popular, and all, all his friends abandoned him. They all left him. Uh, his closest friends denied him. He had a heavenly father who he knew, but he died on a cross in agony and suffering and shame alone. He died there uh, for you and for me. But look at verse 13. Just read verse 13 there. I'll read it for us. For great is your love towards me, says Jesus, for you have delivered me from the depths of the grave. I died, but I was raised again, Jesus. So if we are trusting in Jesus, then we can be confident that even though things go wrong, God will rescue us out of the grave, even though things go absolutely wrong. Because he rescued uh, Jesus. David sought a sign. Perhaps we need a, a sign of God's love for us in tough times. So just look at verse, whoops, verse 17. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies might see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. And God, by raising Jesus to life again, he has given us a great sign that he loves us. Uh, that he cares, us, cares for us. You'll never be more loved than you are in Jesus. God loves you so much that he sent his only son uh, to die for you. And he gave you a sign of that and a hope for the future by raising Jesus to life again. So no matter what happens in life, even if everything goes wrong, even if you lose everything, God still loves you and cares for you. He's raised Jesus to life again, and he'll raise you to life again, to be with him forever uh, in Jesus' name. Right, we're going to close uh, in a prayer uh, on that. So, Father, we, we thank you that you've given us a glorious son, that you love us, that you care for us, that you sent Jesus to die for us, that even though we, we get these things wrong, uh, when we go through tough times, even though we, we, this seems so far away from us, we know that you love us and you care for us and that we can be confident uh, because of Jesus, not because of anything we do. Please help us to be filled with the joy of the gospel uh, as we go out uh, this day and this week, as we celebrate communion. Please may we be filled with joy of good news that you love us and that you sent your son 
to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, we're going to... Uh,